Hi, I'm David. I'm the coordinator of the Maths Learning Centre and now you've seen my face, you know what I look like. This is a revision seminar for Maths 1B and uh, it's about Taylor series. Because uh, lots of people have asked me uh, to do something on Taylor series and I've tried for several years in a row to get a really good one on Taylor series and I'm going to give it one more go. Um, in case you hear the echo, I'm actually redoing this because the recording failed yesterday, so I'm talking to an empty room, so it's a bit weird. Uh, but hopefully it'll still be a good seminar anyway. Okay, so first of all I'm going to talk about just the philosophy of Taylor series, um, a little bit of you know, what I, how I think about it, and then I'll get into some, some nitty gritty of how to do stuff later. Um, I'm not going to talk about general power series because there's a, another seminar on that one already, um, with intervals of convergence and, and um, the ratio test and the, and the alternating series test, that's all in another seminar. This one's just about Taylor series themselves. Okay, so some philosophy. All right, so as functions, polynomials are, are nice. And they're sort of the nicest kind of function. You know, you can um, very easily calculate them in a computer because it's just powers and multiplying and addition. Uh, and even the powers um, in a computer, you do it as just multiplying over and over. Uh, and um, just by looking at the formula, you can have a good feel of what the function looks like. You look at the, the highest power, you can tell how many turning points you expect it to have and whether it, uh, whether it goes up at one end and down at the other or both up and both down. Um, they're easy to differentiate, they're easy to integrate, they're really nice functions. In fact, polynomials are to functions what the whole numbers are to all numbers. So um, the whole numbers, the integers, they're really easy to add and multiply. Dividing um, you is, is a bit trickier, but uh, it's still fairly nice. And all the other uh, numbers are built, can be built from the whole numbers by various clever uh, tricks. The real numbers, uh, you have to be a bit clever and have infinite decimal expansions, but you can still build them from the whole numbers. And same with polynomials, actually. You can, uh, they're, they're the simplest kind of function. We have polynomials, which are like the integers in inverted commas, and we have rational functions, which are made out of two polynomials divided, in the same way that rational numbers are made out of two integers divided. Uh, and we have division for polynomials, and it all mirrors what happens with numbers. And so in the same way that we would like to write every real number as like an infinite decimal expansion and write it in terms uh, of whole numbers, we're going to attempt to write all functions as polynomials. And that's the philosophy of Taylor series. Taylor series turn all functions into polynomials. Possibly infinite. So in a way, it's like doing a decimal expansion um, for uh, for an ordinary real number like a square root. So that's the, the idea of Taylor series. Polynomials are really nice functions, and we'd really prefer it that if all functions were polynomials. They're not, but we can get pretty close. If we can have an infinite polynomial, then we can represent pretty much all functions as Taylor series. There are a few major exceptions, um, but we're not going to go into them. Okay, sweet. And the philosophy of how to get a Taylor series is what you do is you make it match a polynomial at one point. Okay, you make it match the function value at that point and the derivative at that point and the second derivative at that point and so on up to as many as you like or forever if you want. So to find Taylor series for f of x, let's call it p of x, make it so that p of x matches f of x at one point. So f at that point will be the same as p of at that point. And the the derivative of f at that point will be the same as the derivative of the polynomial at that point. And the second derivative at that point will be the same as the second derivative of the polynomial at that point, and so on. 
Okay, so that's nice. There's one more thing that um, goes into that, and this is really nice, uh, but if we know a little bit about how derivatives of polynomials work, uh, we can get more easily to how to create the Taylor series so that it does match. So let's see. We'd like the Taylor series to match, so we need to be able to differentiate um, polynomials. So just as an aside, Different. differentiating polynomials. Let's think about it. Polynomials are basically made out of powers of x, or t or whatever the variable is, but x is the most common. If we do x cubed and we differentiate it, we'll get 3x squared, and then we differentiate it again, we'll get 3 times 2x squared, uh, x, sorry, and then we differentiate it again, and we'll get 3 times 2. Nice. Okay, and if we had x to the 7, we differentiate it once, we get 3x, 7x to the 6, we differentiate it again, the 7 would still be there and we'd have 6x to the 5, and we differentiate it again, we'd have 7 times 6 times 5x to the 4, and then, and so on, dot, dot, dot. And we'd eventually get, when it becomes a constant, 7 times 6 times, sorry about that, 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2, which is 7 factorial. And this here is 3 factorial. So there's this idea that if you differentiate x to the n enough times until it's a constant, the answer will be n factorial. Differentiated until it's a constant is n factorial. And that's kind of really cool to me because I'm, I'm, I like combinatorics, I like the, the process of, of counting things and n factorial comes up when you do combinatorics when you're counting how many ways there are to arrange n things but it also comes up in derivatives um, if you differentiate x to the n as, uh, until it's a constant, then what you get is n factorial. And that's actually very cool and um, actually makes a connection between calculus and algebra, which I really like. But at the moment, what it does is it explains why there's all these n factorials in the Taylor series formula. Okay? So let's just talk that through and see how that comes about. Okay? So. Um, Let's do making it match. I'll just double underline this to say that we still haven't left the philosophy section yet. So making it match, let's have a look. I'm going to build this up as I go. So let's do a polynomial. And what we'll do is we'll make it match at A. Okay, so if we make the polynomial just a constant, which is whatever the value of f of A is, say maybe 3, then we sub A into Px and we get, well, whatever the constant is. So now it matches at x equals A. Sweet. The function value matches. So then what we want is we want the derivative to match. Okay, so when we differentiate this, it'll disappear and there'll be nothing there. Okay, so what we'd like is that when we differentiate it, we could do the same trick. We'd love it that if we differentiated this function and subbed in x equals a, then we will get f dash a. All right. So if we put this, then if we differentiated it, we get f dash a, and then when we sub in a, we get f dash a, because it's already f dash a whether we sub it in or not. But the problem is that back here it doesn't match at f of a anymore, um, because we're going to get f a plus f dash a a. So what we need to do to make it match back here is to put minus a in, so that when we sub in x equals a into this one, we get f a plus f dash a a minus a, so this bit becomes zero and it still matches back at the constant. Alright, so let's differentiate it again. So what we like is for this answer to come out to the second derivative um, of f at a. And so what we can do is we can go back here and we can make this f double dash a the same as we did before. But then we're going to have to put one back in here like that. Only problem is that if I differentiate this, I'm going to get a 2 here because we've got f double dash a x minus a 2x minus a. 
because when you differentiate, the power comes down. Okay, so what's going to happen is I'm going to get a 2 here. And that's no good because that's going to put a 2 here. So what I'm going to need to do to fix that is divide by the 2 way back here. So that they cancel each other out and I get the right answer. Okay, one more thing to do. I'm just going to have to make myself some space. E dashed x, that's f dashed a, f dashed a, sorry, f double dashed a on 2x minus a, and p double dashed x. Okay, so let's put another term in, f triple dashed a. I'm expecting it to do this because then when I differentiate it once I'll get f triple dashed a x minus a squared but there'll be a 3 and then when I differentiate it again I'll get um, 3f triple dashed a uh, x minus a but I'll have to times by 2 and then when I differentiate it again I'll get, well that'll disappear and there'll be 2 times 3 f triple dashed a. And again, look, there's my 3 factorial that's coming out. When I differentiate this um, 3 times, I get my 3 factorial coming out. So I'm going to have to divide by my 3 factorial. So that it all works out the way I'd like it to. And that is the philosophy of why Taylor series come out the way they do. Now I do not have to go through differentiating it every time and doing the fixing and changing every time to remember what happens because all I do is I remind myself that I need all the derivatives and the powers going up but I need to divide by the factorial because I know that the derivative of x to the n is n factorial if I differentiate it enough times to get down to a constant. And so that's the philosophy of why uh, they come out the way they do. Um, so, now we're actually up to the formula. So, Taylor polynomial formula goes like this. So we have p, the nth one is f of a plus f dashed a <coughs> x minus a double dashed a over 2 x minus a squared plus blah 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 plus f n a n factorial x minus a to the n and then you stop there and this is called the name of this is the nth Taylor polynomial 4f at x equals a. And note that the proper propositions to go with this is that we have 4f and at x equals a. Those prepositions are the only way that you can connect it to this. Uh, you can also say it's the Taylor polynomial of degree n 4f at x equals a. So you've got three different ways of modifying the Taylor polynomial to tell people um, all the details you need about it. And just to point out this notation here, this brackets n, that means the nth derivative of f. Because, look, if you were um, doing the derivative, right, you'd have f dashed, f double dashed, f triple dashed, f four, you know, and, and you'd cross it out. Well, that's how I would do it. That, that makes me sort of happy to do it that way. Most people don't do that, but it makes me feel better. Um, but that's going to be really difficult to write with, a, with an unknown n. Um, some people, what they do is they, at this stage, they go um, f i v, f v, f v i, uh, because it's um, f i v, uh, where it's, and we're imagining that this is writing Roman numerals here. Um, and so i i i, 
and then the next one is IV because it's four. And so lots of people use Roman numerals uh, when they talk about it, but there comes a point where you can't really in this formula say N in Roman numerals, so we put N in brackets. And we need to put it in brackets because um, if we just put FN without the brackets, people might think that either it was um, FA to the power of N, or that we had done F n times, but we haven't. We've done the derivative n times, so we put it in brackets to tell people that that's what we're doing. So that's why that notation there. Uh, and a Taylor series so the Taylor series formula um, is exactly the same with one subtle difference. So f of x is equal to f of a plus f dash of a x minus a plus blah 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 uh, plus f double dash of a over 2 x minus a squared plus dot 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 plus f n a over n factorial x minus a p n plus dot dot dot. That's the subtle difference. A Taylor polynomial stops and there's a different one for each n and a Taylor series goes on forever. Um, and if you're very lucky, your Taylor series will actually be equal to your function. Okay, so if you do it forever, it will be equal to your function. If you stop at any point, it won't be equal to, to your function, which is why we don't say fx equals here. Um, but if you go forever, it will. And this is called the Taylor series 4f hat x equals a. Okay. Um, do note that it's not actually at a equals a number, um, even though people will use in their notation, well, to the Taylor series when a equals 3, a is just a number that we've, a placeholder for a number that we're going to put in here. When you say it in, per, in you know, on paper, you'll actually say the Taylor series for at x equals 3 or x equals 0. Um, and you won't actually say the letter x anywhere. So I like to give this a a name so that I can um, talk about it. Um, in things that I call this the center. Okay, I call it the center uh, because at that point your function matches everything. Okay, and I also call it the center because it, it, it matches my understanding from um, algebra, um, for, from coordinate geometry. When you do the equation of a conic or a circle or something like that, the x minus a squared. Uh, would tell you that the centre of the circle has x equals a. And so I'm just using the same idea. Um, in the same way as you have mod x minus a equals r, um, the a is the centre of that interval. And so that's my thinking about it. a is the centre um, for that same reason. OK. So we've got the series. Uh, we've done some philosophy. And now um, it is worth pointing out um, that because of some history, um, they have a special name if the centre is zero. So you are allowed to say a Taylor series for effort um, at x equals zero, but you can also just say um, if the centre is zero, it's called a Maclaurin um, polynomial slash series. And I believe that's because Maclaurin and Taylor both simultaneously discovered Taylor series, um, but Maclaurin only did it with centre zero. Um, but because they did it at the same time, people deserve, thought he deserved um, some credit. So it's not like Maclaurin came up with it and then Taylor they extended it, or Taylor came up with it and Maclaurin specialised it. So they came up at the same time. So people thought that, that, that both of them needed some credit. So it's called a Maclaurin series um, if the centre is zero, but you could just as easily say a Taylor series at x equals zero. Um, thus, there's some terminology. And most of the Taylor series that you see written down for you, the classic ones, um, are actually Maclaurin series. And you can tell whether it's a Maclaurin series or just a general Taylor series by the fact that a Maclaurin series will just have x to the n's in it instead of x minus a's uh, because the a is zero. Uh, so you can tell what the centre is by looking at how the formula is written. OK. so. Now we're on to the next stage. So we know what they are, we know how to figure them out. At this stage, I could do two different things. I could say that um, 
I could do some examples of figuring out a Taylor series from scratch using the derivatives, um, and I could talk uh, and I could talk about um, figuring out Taylor polynomial and how close it is to your real uh, to your real function. I could talk about that. I could also go the other way and talk about the, the classic series that we happen to know and you're supposed to remember and how to turn Taylor series into other Taylor series. Um, and there are two different approaches I could take. I will do them both. Uh, what I'm going to start with is the classic Taylor series because it's very important for you to be able to notice that these exist and whenever you're doing work with Taylor series to be able to say, oh, that's one of those ones. Um, because the more stuff you know, pardon me, the better you are at problem solving. So I just want to get some stuff um, out there. Classic Taylor series. Though technically they are Maclaurin series. Okay, so these are the classic Taylor series. 1 over 1 minus x, that function has a Taylor series that looks like this. 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus forever. Okay, so all those n factorials have actually cancelled out and left me with just a 1 as the coefficient. So that's great. Um, and uh, you know, you might know this under another guise. We can write it as an infinite series. That's the geometric series. Okay, so over in, um, in uh, power series section of the course, um, you will see it the other way around. You'll see this first, and then you'll see that it comes out to this answer. But Taylor series is the other way around. We have a function, and it happens to be equal to an infinite series. Um, and so either way, you need to be able to see this and be able to turn it into that, or this and turn it into that, depending on what situation you're in. Okay, so that's your classic... Um, first classic Taylor series, and I should point out this only works if x is less than 1. Okay, the size of x is less than 1. Okay, that's your first classic Taylor series. Awesome. The next classic Taylor series is e to the x. So it's 1 plus x plus x squared on 2 plus x cubed on 3 factorial plus x to the 4 on 4 factorial plus blah 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 and forever. So that is um, e to the power of x. And we can write that as an infinite sum as well. x to the n. So the sum from n equals 0 to infinity x to the n on n factorial. Okay? So um, the difference between this and the geometric series is that n factorial that's in there. Okay, and uh, what is it? Um, when does this work? Well, this and, and all x doesn't matter what x is; it will always work. It even works for complex x, actually. Um, so that works no matter what x is. So even though the previous one only works as when the size of x is less than one, because of that n factorial, this function, um, this will converge no matter what x is. Okay, so worthy of note that if you are doing power series, if you happen to know that something looks like something to the n over n factorial, you are allowed to just say that it's equal to e to the whatever. Um, because you're supposed to be able to recognise that um, infinite series. Alright. The next one is sine and cos. So, let me write it out. Okay, so I've got x minus x cubed on 3 factorial plus x to the 5 and 5 factorial minus oh, right, and so on. It goes on forever. And um, that's all great to write that down, but what you need is a mantra in your head to help you remember it, um, because I was actually doing that from a description in my head of what it looks like. This one I can remember, you know, and, and even that I still have a description. It's 1, x, x squared, x cubed, x four, and then I divide them all by, x fact by n factorial. This one, well, let's see if we can remember it. Actually, what it is, it's just the odd ones in e to the x. Okay, x to the 1, x cubed, x to the 5, x to the 7. So, same as e to the x, but only the odd ones. 
and it alternates plus and minus. And I know that the first one has to be a plus. I know the first one has to be a plus um, because sine of um, sine x on x is one. See, um, if I divide everything by x, I'll get sine x on x. And when x is zero, that comes out to one. So I know it has to be positive there uh, because sine x on x is one. And I can write this as an infinite series too. So let's see. Um, right, well I know it alternates, so it has to have like a minus one to the n in it. Um, and I know it's like x to the something over something factorial. And that something is always an odd number. So I could technically, if I wanted to, write here n equals zero to infinity n odd, just there. Um, but that would make my minus one to the n a little bit tricky because minus one to the n is always minus one if n is odd. So, okay. So to make it an odd number, I could do two n plus one. That would make it odd. If you do two n plus one on any whole number, you always get an odd number. And when I start with n equals zero, I'll get x to the two times zero plus one. So that'd be x to the to the one. So yes, it will start at x. Uh, and let me just see what happens when I do this. If I do n equals zero, it will be minus one to the zero, which is plus one. If I do n equals one, I'll get minus one x to the three over three factorial, which is correct. Okay, so this is the correct sum. Okay, the, the point I'm trying to make out is that that sum, uh, what, A, what that sum is telling you, and B, um, how to remember it from this concept here. It's the same as e to the x, but only odd numbers, and it alternates between plus and minus one. Each part of this formula is telling me that information. All right, cos x. Well, you could take a guess if there were people in the room, and as there were yesterday, I got them to guess what it was. But anyway, cos x um, only has the even numbers. Um, the even powers from uh, e to the x. So 1, which is x to the 0, uh, minus x squared on 2 factorial, plus x to the 4 on 4 factorial, minus x to the 6 on 6 factorial, plus blah, 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 blah. OK, so um, it's actually, I had to, didn't mention this earlier, but the reason why sine only has odd powers is because sine is an odd function. Odd functions, when you do their Taylor series, will only have odd powers. And even functions, when you do their Taylor series, will only have even powers. OK, so um, that's a useful thing to know. So that's why, you, and a way of remembering that cos x only has the even powers, because it's an even function. Um, and again, I can do this. It's the same as e to the x, but only even ones. Alternates plus or minus. OK. Um, and I know it starts at plus 1, because I mean, if it alternates, it could be minus, plus, minus, plus. I know it starts at plus 1, because cos of 0 is 1. If I sub in 0 into this, I'll get cos of 0 is 1, which is the correct answer. So I know it starts at plus 1. So that's how I remember that. And this is a sum as well. So it's only the even powers. 2n will make it even. And minus 1 to the n, let's just check. When n is 0, I'll get x to the 0, which is 1, and I'll get plus 1. Yes, OK, that's the correct starting place. All right, so that's your, your geometric series, um, your e to the x and your sine x, and your cos x. Oh, just a second, sine x works for all x, and cos x works for all x. OK, no matter what x you pick, put in, it will, still, it will work out to cos x. And when I say work out to, I mean that this series will actually converge. It's not like it will just blow up and become infinity or just flip-flop between two numbers. It will actually come to a number, and that number is cos x. Right. So just as a guess, um, uh, you, it would be really cool if you tried to think, what would, do you think would happen if it didn't alternate? If you just took every second power, um, every, every second power from e to the x, but they're all plus, what do you reckon? All 
All right, it's a bit of a door of the explorer moment where I expect you to, to answer the question. Um, the answer actually is um, Shine and Kosh. Shine X is, one, is just the odd powers from E to the X. X plus X cubed on 3 factorial plus X to the 5 and 5 factorial plus blah blah blah. Just the odd powers, all plus the same as they are in E to the X. And Kosh X is just the even powers. 1 plus X squared on 2 factorial plus X 4 on 4 factorial plus blah blah blah. Um, and I think that's really super awesome that cos and cosh have roughly the same Taylor series, it's just that cos has pluses and minuses in it. Um, which kind of makes sense because cos is sort of alternate, um, uh, cos as a function wiggles, and you would expect its Taylor series to wiggle as well. Um, and it's also really cool because you know that shine, -esh, shine x plus cosh x is e to the x, um, because um, shine x is e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2, and cosh x is e to the x, um, sorry, crap. Shine x is e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2, and cosh x is e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. So when you add them together, you actually get e to the x, which you do because you get all the odd terms and all the even terms, and together it's all the terms of e to the x, which is super awesome. Um, yes, and so that's just one more reason why um, these functions that we construct out of e to the x actually should be labelled as sine something and cos something uh, because they're very similar to sine and cos. All right, so the last and most complex one um, on the list of classic Taylor series is the binomial series. And it goes like this, 1 plus x to the k, for some k, k is allowed to be any number, um, it's a, a real number, uh, and uh, this is how it goes. 1 plus k choose 1 x plus k choose 2x squared plus k choose 3x cubed plus blah blah blah. Uh, this is called the binomial series. The binomial refers to um, these two things inside the bracket here. The bi means two and the nom means names. So we have two names here, one and x, and they are inside the bracket. So that's what the binomial refers to, and it's a binomial series because it's how to e expand out a binomial thing. Okay, and that's all well and good, except we don't know what this thing means. Uh, K choose 2, K choose 3, etc. Uh, so, I should probably talk about that, really. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to so only works if the absolute value of x is less than 1, so you need the size of x to be less than 1, and that's of course k as a whole number, and then it works for any x. So I'll just pop that in there. If K is in, actually only work that with a natural number, not the negative ones, not so much. Um, and then it works for any X. Okay. Right, so that's great. It's easy to remember at this stage because you've got this random symbol. Um, but we need to tell you what that symbol means. And that symbol is the extended um, binomial coefficient, they call it. I call it choose. Um, so just as an aside, uh, K choose R. Uh, this is how you do it. Okay, so uh, when you do K choose R, you start with the number K and you times it by a number that's one less, so K minus one, and then you times it by the number that's one less than that, K minus two, and you keep doing that for a while. But you don't obviously do it forever. Um, you only do it as far as R times. Okay, so on the bottom you have one R times R minus one times R times one, and on the top you have k times k minus 1 times blah, 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 times k minus r. Not k minus r, because the first one was k minus 0. Uh, so that's why it works that way. So that's a confusing formula, the way it's written. But what it means is um, that on the top, uh, on the bottom, you have the, whatever the, um, the power is that you're up to. And that's always a whole number um, times down to 1. And then on the top you have the same number of terms getting one less each time. So for example, 3 quarters choose 2 uh, would be, on the bottom we have 2 times 1, uh, starting at 2 and working my way down. And on the top we have 3 quarters and 1 less than 3 quarters, which would be minus a quarter. <coughs> 
And so that would be, let's see, minus 3 on the top. On the bottom I've got 4 times 4, which is 16 times 2, which is 32. Let me do an ordinary one that's with just whole numbers. Uh, so on the bottom we have 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And on the top, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. I just do as many as there are on the bottom. And then let's see, they cancel with that, that becomes a 3, that becomes a 2. So I've got uh, 3 times 2 times 7 times 6, so 36 times 7. Let me just figure that out. 6 times 7 is 42, 3 times 7. So 252, and it's a whole number. It'll always be a whole number if, both of the, if the top one is a whole number. And uh, let me do what happens when the, the number at the top is a, is a whole number, but it's smaller than the one at the bottom. So let's see, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 on the bottom, because that's always what you do on the bottom. And on the top, we'll have 3 times 2 times 1 times 0 times minus 1. And that will be uh, 0. And if you think about it a little bit, if the bottom number is, if the top number is a whole number and the bottom number is bigger than it, you'll always get the answer 0 because as this goes down, once you pass 0, the answer is 0. I mean, so this explains why it always converges um, when um, k is a, a natural number, um, and that's because after you get past the power, all the rest of them after that are 0, so it's just a polynomial. Okay, so that's my aside um, of examples of what the choose mean. Let me just do an example of actually expanding one out. And in the seminar yesterday I asked someone for a random power and someone said 7 twelfths, which is an ex excellently random power. So this would be, and I'll just do the first ones instead of actually having a proper series for it, one, like an infinite terms, 7 twelfths choose 1 x plus 7 twelfths choose 2 x squared plus 7 12th choose 3 x cubed plus and so on. So I'll just do the first four. It always starts at 1. Okay, so let's see. 7 12th choose 1 uh, will be just 7 12th. Because on the bottom you have just 1 and you're not going to make it any longer. So um, anything choose 1 is always whatever the thing was. So that's a good start. And let's see. 7 twelfths choose 2 would be 2 times 1 on the bottom. 7 twelfths times, now that minus 1 would be minus 5 twelfths. And so we're getting on the top minus 35. On the bottom 12 times 12 is 144, 288. And then 7 twelfths choose 3 would be, on the bottom we have 3 times 2 times 1. On the top we have 7 twelfths. We go down 1. And then we go down 1 again, so we take off 12 twelfths, so minus 17 twelfths. Oh, I'm not going to do that one in my head. Uh, let me just get a calculator out. So on the top we have 7 and 5 and 17, which is 595. And on the bottom we have 12, 12, 12, and 6. 12 times 12 times 12 times 6. 10368. Awful. Um, so 1 plus x to the 7 twelfths is 1 plus 7 twelfths of x minus 35 288 of x squared plus. 595 10368 of x cubed. The next one's going to be minus because if you look closely, we'll go when we go down another one, we're going to get another negative number and there'll be three minuses. And so the next one will be a minus. It'll be alternating after this. And so that there you go. Alright. Um, you can use that to approximate stuff, uh, but I'm not going to do that example. Um, I'm sorry, because I, I want to talk about making new things from old. So let's see.
So my idea here is that, look, in the same way that with natural, with the, the integers, you can do various things, and from those you can create other numbers, um, from Taylor series, you can create other Taylor series. I mean, we want to know what happens to Taylor series when we do the things that we normally do to functions. So functions, we can add them, and we can add Taylor series, sure, we'll just add them term by term. Functions, we can multiply them by stuff, we can divide them by stuff, um, we can uh, differentiate them, we can sub stuff into them, we can integrate them, and then we want to know what that does to Taylor series so that we can have some tricks for figuring out things that we like. Okay? So these are some things that we can do um, to make new from old. We can sub things in. Okay? Uh, we can. Um, Divide or multiply, uh, but only by powers of x. Uh, that's because it's not going to work very well otherwise. Um, hmm, it might work a different way, but I'll, I'll just leave that. Um, we can... Uh, and uh, we can integrate or differentiate. So let's have a look at those things, hey? Alright, so here's an example. Uh, look. Find the Maclaurin series. for uh, cos of root x. Alright, well let's see. We know what cos x is. It's the even ones. And they alternate. So we should just sub in root x and see what we get. So 1 minus root x squared on 2 factorial plus root x to the 4 on 4 factorial minus root x to the 6 on 6 factorial plus blah blah blah. And um, cool, well let's see, root x squared is just x. Uh, that will be x squared. Nice. Right, so we have a Taylor series. Now the reason this works is, every function, if it has a Taylor series that works, will only have one at every different centre. So if we want one with centre zero, um, there's only going to be one with centre zero. So if we happen to find a series that is equal to my function, um, then it is the only one. And so therefore, if I find one, there it is. So that must be the Taylor series. Now this particular approach wouldn't work for sine root x, uh, because when I did root x cubed, I'd get an x to the half power. And of course, Taylor series can only have whole number powers. So if you did uh, sine root x, well, you, yeah, you might be a bit stuffed. Um, you might have to actually do it the long way and do roots. Um, and then it would turn into a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of uh, product rules and it would get horrible. Uh, but, it, you know, this is a start. Okay. Um, we could, if we wanted to, attempt to figure out um, what the formula is for this um, from this information. We could have actually subbed it into the, to the, to the summation formula. Um, we could create our own summation formula uh, if we want. Um, it looks like it's the x to the n, certainly, because it's one, 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, the number on the bottom is twice the number on the top and it alternates, and yes, that's correct, because when I put in zero, it's the correct number. I could have just simply subbed in root x into the other formula, and it would have worked perfectly well, because um, root x squared, give me x, and then the n is still there. Okay. So another example for subbing in is that you can use subbing in to figure out if you know a Taylor series at one point, you can figure out a Taylor series at a different point. Okay, with, a, uh, with one centre you can figure out a Taylor series with a different centre. So find C 
series for e to the x at x equals 2. Okay? Well, we know what the Taylor series is for e to the x. Um, and we know that the Taylor series for e to the x at x equals 2 will have a whole lot of x minus 2s in it. So if I sub in e to the x minus 2, uh, if I sub in x minus 2 into the Taylor series for e to the x, I'll get all those x minus 2s. But the problem is that'll be the Taylor series for e to the x minus 2. I want the Taylor series for e to the x. So here's the trick that we use. e to the x would be e to the x minus 2 plus 2. All right, I can subtract two, I can add two. Uh, one of my staff, Fergus, calls this a Cinderella, uh, the Cinderella move. So yes, Cinderella, you can have a minus two, but you have to give it back at midnight. Um, and so you could, yeah, anyway, that, I think it's funny. Uh, so he, um, he suggests that, and we will continue. Now what we want is the e to the x minus two, because that's going to give us a Taylor series with x minus twos in it. And so what I'll do is I'll use the, the properties of e plus up here is multiplication down below. And I know what e to the x minus 2 is. It would be 1 plus x x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x um, cubed over 3 factorial plus dot dot dot. But we're not using x, we're using x minus 2 instead. And that would become equal to, can I fit that in? No, I'll just put it on the, it would be cleaner if it was on this page. e squared plus e squared x minus 2 plus e squared x minus 2 squared on 2 plus e squared cubed, no, e squared x minus 2 cubed on 3 factorial plus 1. Well, so that is actually literally the Taylor series for e to the x at x minus 2. Because what we have is a e polynomial with real coefficients, e squared is perfectly good real coefficients, um, so with real coefficients um, that... So, sorry, just press something. Uh, with real coefficients um, that has x minus powers of x minus 2 in it, that converges to e to the x. So it is the Taylor series. Um, note, you could have gotten this by differentiating, right? If I differentiate e to the x and then sub in 2, I'll get e squared. And so that should be what's in the, in the, uh, the coefficient here. Uh, here. If I differentiate it twice, sub in e, uh, 2, I'll get e squared. If I differentiate it three times, sub in 2, I'll get e squared. So that is the f double dash, triple dash a that we, we normally have, but we can get it from the Taylor series. Um, I might do one more that wasn't in the other revision seminar. Um, find the Taylor series um, for 1 over x at x equals, say, 3. OK? So I couldn't do it at x equals 0 because it's not defined there, but I can certainly do it at x equals 3. So what, here's where I need to know my classic series. I need a series that looks something like 1 over x, and I do have one. It's uh, 1 over 1 minus x. And so I need to somehow turn this into 1 over 1 minus x. So here we go. 1 over x would be 1 over... Huh. Well, I suppose it would be minus 1 over minus x. But I really need it to be minus... Dip again. I really need it to be minus x minus 3. Uh, well, why don't I do my Cinderella trick? Yep. And then that would be 1 over um, x... I did a minus 1 over 3 minus x minus 3. And if it was 1 over 1 minus whatever, that's the one I want. So if I divide the top and bottom by 3, I'll get that. Minus a third over 1 minus a third of x minus 3. 
that will do the trick. Because now I have minus a third, 1 over 1 minus a third of x minus 3. And now I can do the Taylor series for that, because I've got a third minus a third. And the Taylor series for 1 over 1 minus x is just the powers of that. So 1 plus that plus that squared plus that cubed plus forever. And we have 1 plus a third of x minus 3 plus a third squared of x minus 3 squared plus a third cubed of x minus 3 cubed plus and so on. And there's one final step is to multiply out the minus um, this. So we have minus a third minus a ninth of x minus 3 minus a 27th of x minus 3 cubed squared minus, oops, I said 37 there, minus um, an 81th of x minus 3 cubed minus, and so on. And that is my Taylor series for 1 over x at x equals 3. Um, I can figure out when this converges. Um, this will converge um, for mod of this is less than 1, because that's the thing that is in the spot of x. If I multiply both sides by 3, I'll get... And that's actually saying that um, x minus 3 is between 3 and minus 3, so 0 is less than... x is less than 6. Sweet. I feel uncomfortable about all of those minuses. Uh, but I think it will be okay. Oh no! Crap, I have done it wrong. There's not supposed to be all those minuses. Because look at this. Um, if I minus this, that's not going to be 3 minus x minus 3, it's going to be minus 3 minus x minus 3. Ah. Uh, so how am I going to fix that? And then I'm going to have to divide by minus 3. Give me an extra minus in there. Alright. So that'll be minus 1. So when I do minus a third, it'll be a minus there. When I do minus third squared, it'll be a plus. That one will be a minus. Okay, so it's going to alternate. So 1 minus plus minus, okay, that feels better. Right. But this will be the same because mod of minus a third is still plus a third. All right, I've fixed all my minuses now. Um, if that was really bad, I would have had to actually go back and start again. Ah, well. That's the dangers of making things up as you go. Okay. So the other thing we can do is differentiate. So we can differentiate the function and differentiate each term in the series. And so for example, now I can't think of any really good examples um, that this is useful for finding Taylor series. It's way, way more useful to use integrals to find Taylor series. Um, but I just want to give you an example um, of something that, that just makes everything make sense um, and, and fit together. e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial plus and so on. And if I differentiate it, The 1 will disappear, the x will become a 1. I'll have a 1 on 2 factorial, but then I'll get 2x. I'll still have a 1 on 3 factorial, there'll be a 3x squared. I have a 1 on 4 factorial, there'll be a 4x cubed, and so on. Okay. Oh, but look, the 2 cancels the 2 factorial to give me an x. 
Now, 3 factorial is 1 times 2 times 3, and that 3 will cancel with the 3 on the top, and I'll just have 1 times 2, so I'll get this. And 4 factorial will be 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, and that would cancel with the 4 on the top, and so I'll get this. Oh my, that's just e to the x again. So I can confirm that everything works the way it ought to. See, look, if I differentiate each term, um, it gives me the same answer as I would if I actually differentiated the function. Yay! Not that that's a proof. We've got one function, which is a very special function, um, but it ma makes you believe it a little more. Integrating. We can... integrate each term, but be careful it has to be from the centre up to x of thing dt. That's important. Um, okay, you have to go from the centre. Um, I had a good, good look in the, in the notes and it's very clear that it's the A at that spot. It's the centre of your Taylor series. Okay, so if you've got a Maclaurin series, you have to go from zero. So this is useful for finding um, Taylor series of things um, that you um, of things that you know that the derivative looks like something that you know. So I'm going to do an example. It's going to be a bit long um, and gruesome, but bear with me. Find the Maclaurin series. For r uh, sine x. Now, I don't really feel like differentiating r uh, sine and then differentiating that and then differentiating that. That just sounds like a way lots of work. But I do know that the derivative of arc sine is a binomial. Okay, it's got a root, but that's okay. Root's just a power. And underneath that is two things: a constant uh, and a number. And so the 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 um, derivative of arc sine is a binomial, and so I should be able to use the binomial series. So maybe I'll just do let's just ask for the first four terms. Okay. So let's see. Well, we know that the derivative of arc sine is 1 over root 1 minus x squared, which is 1 minus x squared to the minus a half, which is 1 plus minus x squared to the minus a half. The reason I've written it with a plus sign is so that I can realise um, that this is the x that you normally see in the binomial um, series. So, we'll expand it out using the binomial series. One plus minus... x squared to the minus a half will be one plus minus a half, choose one of thing plus minus a half choose two of thing squared, plus minus a half choose three of thing cubed, and the thing is minus x squared. So I'm going to have one minus a half choose one of, actually, of minus x squared, plus, because when you square the minus it'll come out of the plus squared, uh, and when you square that, cube that minus, it'll come out as a minus. But that won't be x squared, it'll be x squared squared, this will be x squared cubed, which will be a 6. Okay, so it looks like we're getting the even powers, um, which is good. That would, that would make sense. Um, arc sine um, should um, be involved like every second power, since sine involves every second power. Arc sine is actually an odd function, um, so its derivative should be an even function, which is kind of cool. All right, um, and let's see, minus a half. I might just figure out what these things are separately. Minus a half, choose one, would be minus a half. 
minus a half choose two would be minus a half on the bottom two times one minus a half take another one would be minus three on two so that would be plus three on two 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 on eight minus a half choose three would be minus a three times two times one minus a half minus three halves we'll have to do another one so that would be minus 15 actually that three is going to cancel with that one <coughs> rubber fell down on the floor so you can get minus five on one, two, three, four. So I reckon there's going to be a pattern there actually. Um, the next one will go down another odd, right? We'll go down to minus seven. Um, yeah, I probably shouldn't have cancelled it out because I'm getting a, a um, um, an, an illusion here. It doesn't go three to five. The next one's going to have a five and a seven, but they're not going to cancel out with anything on the bottom. So it's actually the product of, yeah, okay. So if I was actually going to try and find a formula for this, um, I would not be trying to figure out what the numbers are and I would be leaving it in the other format. And I'll hopefully do another example of that um, if I have time. Okay, so that's an aside. So one plus minus x squared to the minus a half is one minus minus a half, so plus a half x squared plus three eighths of x to the four minus minus five sixteenths of x to the six. Excellent. And technically that's actually the first twelve, um, that's actually uh, the first six terms, but it'll do. All right. Oh, just a second. <laughs> we haven't actually found the Taylor series for arc sine. We found the Taylor series for the derivative of arc sine. So we're going to integrate. We're going to integrate both sides. We have to be careful. It has to be the integral from 0 up to x um, of whatever t dt. So <coughs> OK. So from 0 to x, 1 plus minus t squared to the minus a half dt. I would use x's and x's there like physicists do, but mathematicians find it a little bit uncomfortable having both of the, um, the variables, um, having a variable down below and at the top. Um, physicists do it all the time and they don't care. So I'm going to do um, each term separately. So the integral of 1 from 0 to x and the integral half of x squared from 0 to x and 3 eighths of x to the 4 from 0 to x and 5 sixteenths of x to the 6 from 0 to x. And I know that seemed like overkill, but I just wanted to be sure. Now if I sub in 0 into... Um, well, when I'm, just a second. I haven't actually done the integral, have I? just copied the function that I had. So the integral of 1 is x, the integral of a half of x squared, power will go up by 1, and I'll get a third of x cubed. Power will go up by 1, x to the 5, power will go up by 1, uh, and I'll get x to the 7. And so when I sub in 0 into all of those, it will come out to 0, so, oh, crap. Sorry. These are technically supposed to be t's. I will get x plus a 6 of x cubed plus uh, 3 fortieths of x to the 5 plus 5 on whatever 16 times 7 is. Hundred and twelve. Okay, but on the other hand, we also know that the integral from zero to x 
of 1 plus minus t squared to the minus a half dt is also equal to arc sine from 0 to x, which is arc sine x minus arc sine 0, which would be arc sine x. Now I did this explicitly because some functions when you sub in 0 it won't be 0 here. And you've got arc sine x minus 1 and you have to add the 1 or the whatever uh, arc sine x minus number and you have to no add the number to the other side and it will change the first term of your Taylor series. So x plus a 6 of x cubed plus 3 fortieths of x to 5 plus 5 twelfths of x plus 112 of x to the 7 plus and so on. Right, and so we're good arc sine we know is an odd function because sine is an odd function and it's only got odd powers so that's, that's comforting. Um, it makes us feel like we've got something right. Um, ooh, 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 ooh. I've lost my minuses, haven't I? No, that's okay, they all went away. Brilliant. Right. Just let me just let me give uh, one more um, thing about that. I just wanted to make a comment about guessing um, formulas uh, for series. So we uh, had things that were looking something like this. Let me just go back to where we were before here. So guessing formulas for things. Okay, so guessing formulas for things. Um, back here, I noticed that when I created, um, figured out what this was, it lost information about how this was made. So if I wanted to guess a formula for what this was in terms of n, um, then um, I would need to keep all this information. So let's just try guessing a formula for um, minus a half choose n. Okay? So we know that we were down to here, minus a half choose 3, minus a half times minus three halves times minus five halves over three times two times one uh, and we had minus a half let's just do the next one choose four would be minus a half times minus three halves times minus five halves times minus um, seven halves over four times three times two times one okay So um, let's just pull this apart. We have one, two, three, four minuses. Okay, so that would be minus one to the four. And then we have one times three times five times seven. So the first four odd numbers. So we're going to have one times three times times two n plus one. Just a second though. I would do two n plus one. Um, except that 2n plus 1 would actually give me 9. So it must be 2n minus 1. And on the bottom we have 4 factorial. So we can guess that formula. Uh, we can guess that formula by going, well, let's just see. This is my n here. Um, and four. that's my n there and there and there. So I have that I'm guessing that minus half choose n is minus 1 to the n times 2n minus 1 over n factorial. And that's a way of guessing things um, by not expanding them out as you go. Alright, I'm going to finish there and I'll do the other half of the, the seminar that didn't record um, in a little bit after I've done a revision seminar for someone else. Um, and so there's, there'll be a video below this one which is the next video.